Amanda Glass is an author, wife, and mom helping families make big changes in mindset through small practical steps. Caring about kids and the adults in their lives, she has created the Made For Books to help provide positive tools that help families connect and grow together. She married her high school sweetheart, loves to scooter around town, and I especially love this because it's practical. Her favorite Mother's Day gift was a leaf blower. So (laughs) welcome, Amanda. (laughs) Hi. Thanks for having me today, Jen. Oh, I'm so so glad you can be here. Um, That gave us a glimpse into who you are, but why don't you take a moment and tell us a little bit more about uh, where you're from and maybe a little bit about your family. Okay. Well, I grew up in um, a small town in West Virginia. Um, at the very northern tip of the northern panhandles. So a small little town, and that's where uh, I grew up, and um, my family is mostly still there now. Um, My, I I was the youngest of three girls, so it was a house of women and ladies. And (laughs) Your poor dad. (laughs) Yeah, I know, I know. And I, I met my husband in high school. We were high school sweethearts, and we married one week after college graduation, so. Uh, we are about to celebrate our 21st um, wedding anniversary, and um, we have three kids, ages 16, I have to think about this, 10 and 8, and so we've got a new driver in the house. We are busy with um, lacrosse, gymnastics, baseball, and we're all adjusting to this new busy period after such a long, quiet season of quarantine. So yes. we're all we're all readjusting and getting used to being busy again. So oh. um, that's we live near Pittsburgh, and um, family's pretty close by. So that's nice. We get to see them quite a bit. And um, yeah, that's great. That's great. Having a driver, having a child who drives, changes everything. It's wonderful. It is wonderful. You know, there's a lot of, you know, anxiety. I hear a lot of people talk about, oh no, and, but I'm excited for him. I remember getting my license. I remember how freeing it was and how you could drive yourself to practices. And, and that has become uh, my favorite part. Yes. He's able to get himself. And like last night he picked up my son from his practice and Charlotte from hers. And yep. It's life is easier. We have five kids and um, my older two are both going to be gone in the fall. And it dawned on me this week, I went, I will not have another driver. I will be back to <laughs> the driving. And i that's the worst yeah. part. <laughs> yeah. I love that that thought came in your mind because you remember those days, right? All of a sudden, <laughs> they were forgotten. And now you remember them. Oh, no, (laughs) I got to do that again. Right. We need more kids in the gaps. No, we don't need more kids. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well, Mm -hmm. before we start, we're going to talk today about um, dads. That's our topic. But before we um, start talking about this great book that you wrote about dads, let's back up a bit and let's talk um, maybe about how you even got started as a writer. Is it something that you've always wanted to do or did you stumble into it? No, writing was not on my radar. It was um, the farthest thing from my mind. I Mm. thought I was a math girl. I always liked the clarity of having a right or wrong answer and knowing what to do and the order of math. But in college, I switched my major from math to psychology and it really was to just graduate faster, to Mm. be honest. I didn't love, I didn't love the idea of doing uh, math my whole life, but I didn't really know what else to do. And I thought, well, I'll just go to graduate school anyway, so I'll just get my bachelor's degree. So then I um, started a graduate program in guidance counseling, switched my major in the middle of that program and uh, to human development. I kind Mm -hmm. of followed my heart and wanted to learn more about communities and and not only children, but, but adults too. And so for all of those moms listening, and maybe you have a child who's switching majors, you know, God can still guide and direct. He did this. He did that for me. So I graduated with my master's degree and didn't really know what I was going to do. And I just fell into um, behavior analysis and the autism spectrum, which I didn't even know was a thing when I was in college. And so in that field, I got to use math and I got to use my 
uh, love of people and children. And so um, I landed into that and really fell in love with the idea of quality of life and how we could increase that within children's lives and families and schools. And so I really enjoyed making um, tools and books, visuals, systems mm -hmm. that helped kids navigate the world, make uh, better connections and communicate clearly. And so that became uh, my my favorite part about my work and seeing those things, those changes. Um, and so I got to write some stories in that time, some social stories, and um, that was fun to create in that way. And it wasn't until I started having a health problem and I had a lot of questions and I needed to find answers. And so that's when I became a reader and I started reading for answers. I read for hope. Mm -hmm. I read for plans and um, I just read and read and read and my eyes were opened and my heart was open to how words can change lives. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's, we, if you can pass hope to somebody else, cause I look back on that time and I was a young mom. I had a baby who was one and a half. I had no guidance from the doctors that I was seeing. And because people chose to write about hard times or write about their own journey, I had hope to move forward. Mm. And so, um, it, there was a seed planted and I thought, okay, God, maybe this really difficult time and I don't see any way out of this, but maybe I can share hope to somebody else. And so yeah. that's when I started thinking about writing and I became a reader. Uh, <laughs> that's really cool. And lots of parallels to me. Interesting. Yeah. I was going to be a math teacher. <laughs> I was, oh, yeah. you know, so, um, that's, that really, that's great because words are powerful and, yeah. um, spoken words are powerful, but there's something about that written word because it's like a time capsule and mm -hmm. it can, it can reach so far beyond a conversation. Mm -hmm. So or, that's really or, cool. Yeah. Or in the dark of the night when, yeah. you know, you're not going to talk to anybody else, but you need some hope, right? You can yes. open the Bible. You can open a story and yeah, that can, the, you can find some um, safety in that. So, so yeah, that's speak. when I, yes, right. That's great. Well, tell me a little bit about your dad. What was he like? Well, my dad was um, an only child and he married my mom, they were also high school sweethearts, and mm. she came from a big family. So he came from a very small family with a lot of like a, a small group of adults, and he was the only child. And my mom was one of six, and they've all had lots of children, and those children have had children. So it's it's quite a, a difference. But I think that he probably grew up without um in, in a way that that he was the only one and maybe he was um, he related to adults and 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 probably was on stage a lot for them. I, he was a uh, tap dancer. My grandma had him in piano and guitar and he sang in a band. And so he had a, a childhood that seems like maybe all eyes were on him. Yeah. Um, and. Then he married uh, my mom and uh, they had two girls pretty close together. My sisters are only a year apart. And then I came seven years later. So, okay. yeah. So he was, um, when I was probably around five or six, times got a little bit tough in our area and steel mills were closing and a lot of the laborers were left to find other jobs, which were very few and far between. And so my memories of my dad are mm -hmm. him working multiple jobs, trying to keep our family afloat uh, financially. He was home, uh, but did a lot of shift works, uh, you know, different times that he'd be home and when he wasn't, but he was home. I remember him being there a lot. He would um, be really tired. Um, mm -hmm. And he was probably looking back pretty stressed about keeping our family 
fed and clothed and all of those things that a parent, you know, has to do. And so um, he was a funny guy with, I remember him just always trying to make people strangers, you know, Mm -hmm. smile. He would crack a joke. He would say something to make them smile. Um, And he was um, just a a, a nice guy. And um, he was, he was at our home, but he wasn't emotionally available. Mm. That makes sense. Yes. He was physically Um, present, but not there. (laughs) Yes. And I just remember feeling at a very young age that I wasn't really connected to him. Mm. I was the youngest. And so a lot of my experiences for, you know, living through my older sisters, going to their activities, doing their things. We went to church um, a lot as a, as my mom took us three girls to church. My dad didn't become a Christian until he was, I, I was in middle school. So okay. my childhood, I remember doing a lot of things without him. Um, And then things changed a bit when he did become a Christian and he started going to church with us. And that was a different experience and a more richer experience, but he wasn't an emotional guy. We didn't talk about feelings or have tender moments. He wasn't a hugger. He didn't tell me he loved me. Um, I knew he did because he worked and he took care of us, but I didn't really feel that he was someone to go to and have a conversation with. And that, that was, that was, um, I thought normal, which, and now I talk to a lot of people about my book and it's pretty common. Um, but that would just what it just was what it was. And that was our life. And, you know, as a kid, you just sort of, this is just it. It wasn't until, um, I, um, grew up, had my own children that, I started to understand why he wasn't able, or maybe he was doing the best that he could, but that he it just wasn't who he was. Yeah. You know? It's becoming a parent changes everything. It, it shifts that yeah. filter and that lens and you start to see your own parents through a completely different um, set of eyes and you understand yeah. things very differently. That's true. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I rem- Yeah. Well, you I- wrote uh, what dads are made for. And um, this book was inspired by um, such a great story. Would you would you maybe share that story with us? Sure, sure. My um, dad passed away about four years ago. And like I said, I had spent a lifetime really feeling like I wasn't connected to him mm-hmm. deeply. And um, when he passed away, it was a, a, it was a surprise to me that it was so overwhelmingly hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I had never lost a parent before. I had heard people who had lost parents and how, how it can really affect you. But so I I guess I didn't, I wasn't surprised by that, but I was surprised at how long and how hard Mm -hmm. it felt compared to what I was expecting. And, you know, here I was, um, I was in my mid thirties and I just thought, you know, I thought that I wasn't connected to him. Why is this so hard? And of course I wasn't using words like that, but that's how I felt. And, um, two years had passed. And just when I would think that, okay, I've, you know, I've grieved all there is to grieve, like the wave would come back Mm -hmm. and I would think, what is this? What is going, you know, why is this so difficult? And, um, or, and I was even, I remember Googling, like, what are the stages of grief and how long, how long should I expect this to last? Right. And, and as we a math all, person, you're linear. You're like, yes, this should right. be. <laughs> right, right. I, I was but trying to not. make sense of the whole thing. No. And um, I was on a family vacation with um, my husband and our three kids. And we were, we were there for an extended period of time. Uh, we were, my husband was between jobs and we thought let's celebrate this moment and, and really go. So I went there and I was practicing writing and um, he was thinking about what he was gonna do with the future of his career. And um, it was my dad's birthday and so I started writing about him. And um, I was writing about the grief that I felt and as I watched the waves, literal waves come in and go out and I was writing about that. 
And then at some point, I just it just occurred to me to write down all the memories that were special that we did share. Because I would go through the grocery store and I would see strange items that my dad would just think would be funny to buy, like ginger beer or hot peppers or, you know, junk food that he would buy that I, I don't buy now, but I'd look at it and I'd remember my dad and I'd be like, why? Everywhere I look, I see my dad. And then finally, all of a sudden, I realized, you know, all these small moments that we shared that were small, like when we would sing in the car together. Yeah, they were my dad's favorite songs and they were oldies, but we did do that together. And that that was a moment that we shared. Or when he would offer strange, weird drinks to the, you know, to people as they came in the house. That was a moment that we shared. Or when we would play cards on the floor together when I was really young. Mm -hmm. um, that was one memory I do remember spending time with him doing and we would, would do that. And then all of a sudden I started thinking that maybe he didn't meet my expectations or my needs the way that the way I was built, mm -hmm. but all these small moments added up to fill up that big hole that I felt. Mm -hmm. And for the first time I thought, okay, like this is enough. It might not have looked the way I wanted it to look, it might have um, been different, but this is enough. And I can ground myself in these and I can celebrate this. Just like Philippians 4, 8 says, dwell on these things that are honorable and praiseworthy. And just, I just started thinking, how about instead of focusing on what wasn't met, how about I focus on what was and anchor myself in that. And so I, had a had a revelation i wrote about it i felt so much healing in that mm -hmm. moment and then later that day my family was walking along the beach and there were all of these rocks piled up and my daughter she climbed up and she needed help getting down and she reached out her arms and my husband picked her up put her back down on the ground and she said that's what dads are made for oh. and i thought you know she just realized in her little five-year-old heart that her dad was made just to pick her up and put her down. Mm -hmm. And if, if I would have known that, that instead of looking for moments that I, you know, that suited my, my heart at that time, but to focus on the good, yeah. how different my life might have been. And so mm. um, that's why the title of the book is that's what dads are made for. And that's why um, the book follows a little girl's journey. Yeah. She, she wonders, this man is my dad, but what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And she looks at all the other dads that she knows in her life and she sees things about them and she compares them to her dad. And then finally she decides I'm going to make a list of the ways my dad makes me feel special. Yeah. It helps me feel cozy and these questions I can settle. And that those are my favorite lines because once she turns her eyes to what is unique about her and her dad. Mm -hmm. Then she can identify those. She can celebrate those moments and um, move forward. Yes. And, yes. and the tension can be relieved, you know, yeah. if there is any. And oftentimes yeah. there is. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is it's a great book. The text is Thank wonderful. You. The pictures are fabulous. And one of the things that I especially love is um, the diversity of the dads and the kids that you have shown in there. Because you know, my husband and I are white parents with mm -hmm. some mixed race children. So when I saw the picture of the white dad with the mixed daughter, you know, my heart melted because that's that's our family. Um, yeah. So what was it that caused you to think um, intentionally about? including variety rather than just simply only telling the story of this girl and her dad, but yeah. including all these other varieties of, of parents, of dads and daughters. And yeah. Sons. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you noticed that because it's so important to me um, to show diversity and because I do believe representation matters. And when we mm -hmm. can see ourselves in a story um, it becomes not just a book, it becomes like a personal love letter to us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there are characters in the story and I, I 
searching for an illustrator was a process of, of its own. We could probably talk about that for a long time. But when I sure. finally found, when I finally found Bev um, Johnson mm -hmm. and I shared with her that diversity was important to me and that I wanted as many children possible to be able to see themselves in the book. Um, she, she got it right away. And so many of these, they're just her, I, I think she talked about going to the park I think she talked about looking and seeing what was kind of families were that she saw. And um, I was so glad that she did that because in the work that I did with children on the autism spectrum, it was really important for the tools and the stories to be personal to them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it didn't mean anything, you know, generalization is pretty difficult. And so we would have to do things that were specific, you know, pictures of them, pictures of them in their classroom, pictures of them with their, their peers, just to make it that they could identify with the story. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that it was really important for me to have a dad in a wheelchair, because there are dads in wheelchairs. And how often do those children see a dad that looks like theirs or um, different skin tones, um, different ages, and doing different activities that was important as well and so i'm glad you noticed that and um it's one of my favorite parts and it's actually a pillar of the made for books i want okay. every tool every book that i create to be something that um someone can see themselves in and you know my favorite compliments when i hear from parents or if they send me videos of their themselves with the book and their children is when the little boys are going that's me yeah, that's my daddy. Yeah. Or uh, uh, someone else sent me a, a message that said her son looked at the picture of the um, where they're at the playground and said, that's me. And so when they can find themselves in the story, it just means so much more. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and I love too that um, the way that this book is written, it, it really seems like it serves to deepen the father child relationship, no matter what separation um, there might be in distance or time. Was that intentional or was that just sort of a natural byproduct? I'm, I'm going to guess a little of both, but mostly intentional. I Because I wrote it from a daughter's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but yet I was thinking of my daughter's age and I wrote the story about on her age level. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to include think, examples in there that would apply to many. Yes. Uh, I tried to include, there's about five examples of, of what she finds that her, her dad makes her feel special. Mm -hmm. And um, I have one as simple. I thought <clears throat> no matter what the situation what is the most basic thing that a, a dad could do? He could say hi to, at the door. Yeah. And I thought about kids who don't live with their fathers. I thought about kids who don't see their fathers often, but mm -hmm. hopefully the majority of kids say hi to their dad at the door. And so mm -hmm. that's something that they can, they can identify with. Um, another example is the, uh, the dad just tucking the daughter in when she's watching TV, I thought, okay, or they're singing in the car. I thought mm -hmm. that that was probably a very elementary one. And then I put one in there that I personally didn't experience, but was important for me to share because I wanted to give words for dads to use. You know, sometimes dads have a heart to grow yeah. close. They just don't know how. And so the one example where they're sitting on the blanket at night and, and things feel right. And he tells her she's important to him. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to 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 include as many different um, types of yeah. relationships with dads as I, as I could. And so um, I thought that um, I was really happy with I'm happy with the feedback that people are giving, because sometimes yeah. I've heard a few stories of adult um, daughters mm -hmm. filling out in the margins memories they have with their dad and giving the book to their dad for a holiday. and. I just thought what a what a great gift that is for an adult daughter. You know, uh, even though that period of childhood is over, it can still be used as a as a tool to connect, which yes. is really the ultimate yeah. goal. Yeah. Still your daddy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In your bio, um, you talked about, you know, helping wanting to make big changes to mindset through small steps. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, and what kind of, you know, mindset changes um, are you talking about? And how do you do this? Yeah. Well, in my work, 
with um, families and schools, um, we would have, we would sometimes come in and say, what would you like different? Mm -hmm. What would you like to be different at home, at school, just in the student's life? And we would get big goals. Mm -hmm. And they would be, let's say the child doesn't use many words, but in six months time, we want him to have two good friends. Well, we're going to have to break that down into really small steps and build to that goal. And so we would say, what should it look like in five months? What should he look like in three months? What what are the steps we should take now to reach where he should be in one month's time? And what I learned over the years is that it works. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can get overwhelmed by this idea or this goal or this relationship. And we think there's just no hope or I don't even know where to start. But when we think about, okay, how do we break it down into small steps? And then we have to just trust that those small steps will add up to a big change. And so um, I know in my own life that became true during that health journey I spoke to you about. I had to take small steps and trust that that would add up to a big change. And so so I have um, really learned to live my life that way. And so I, I, I love to help others do the same thing. So mm. if there's a relationship with a father and a child and it isn't pretty, yeah. how can we start somewhere? Mm -hmm. And so that's what this book is meant to do. It's meant to meet a family in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And you can just follow the story of the little girl and you can notice the tension that exists there because tension is real and it is normal. Mm -hmm. There aren't any relationships without tension. So let's just acknowledge that first. Right. right. And then we can watch what she does and how she grows closer so that we can start doing the same thing. And then in the end of the book, I have those questions so that adults can learn how to just spark the conversation. Sometimes mm -hmm. just starting that conversation is scary. Yes. And it's hard because we don't know what our kids are going to say. Right. But this um, neutral third party of a book <laughs> right. helps us do this. And this right. is the beginning of a series, right? A, a whole series you've got planned. Yes. Yeah, I do. I have it planned to, to, um, I'm thinking about all relationships that are within a family, right? So grandparents. Okay. What I'm hearing from most people is that the grandparents book should be the next one because of COVID mm -hmm. and how difficult it has been for children to connect with their grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like to have grandparents who aren't capable and able of it. it uh, having a deep relationship. It's more yeah. of a relationship that our children honor mm -hmm. grandparents. And so I'm going to, I'm going to pursue that next. Um, okay. that, book's almost, that book's almost written, but of course I want to do a book for moms mm -hmm. or sisters. Yeah. Brothers. And will you author all of these or are you looking to be more of a publisher where you'll find other people to, to do some as well? Well, um, I think that I, I personally have it in my heart to author the first five or six. Those, those I already have sort of planned out. Mm -hmm. And then I'm open to if, if I get feedback and things, you know, I just have to, I just always am saying, you know, God open doors mm -hmm. and, um, and I'll just walk through them. So if, if people have a heart and they have a story that they would like to share that's that fits along with this idea of being grounded in um, this book was grounded in Philippians four, eight, but mm -hmm. every book should have a vision of, of what it's based on. And um, the stories are, are moving forward and getting people unstuck. That's, that's really what my heart is. So I'm open to that in the future. Yeah. That's great. Well, this yeah. question is a little bit more about you as a mom. Um, so you're obviously a mompreneur. How do you balance being mom with building this business? Oh, Jen, 
What is balance? Is that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is balance? What is balance during COVID? What is balance during, because this book I signed um, to start publishing it and I made a commitment in February of last year. And so March came and the kids came home and, um, you know, I still had deadlines and things that needed to be met. And so that, um, that was actually probably really helpful last year, even though it was stressful. It was, it was, it was a good way to keep going and moving forward on, on something. Um, but my balance looks like, um, I, I naturally have a, have a bend to be present with my kids. Mm-hmm. So I, um, in the, in the situation where I can do that, I can, if they need me and being, being present when they come home and, um, now that things are opening up a little bit, they've enjoyed bringing kids home after school with them, just one or two that, you know, are in their classes. Yeah. And so that's really my most important thing right now in this season, because I still have little ones and, um, and uh, that's, that's the most important thing to me. So the book and, and this effort gets what's left is really how it goes. And okay. unless it's important, like um, when I was launching the book, Mm-hmm. Um, that took a lot of time. And so I had to be more specific and carve that out. And right now, because we're approaching Father's Day and Father's Day is here, we, um, the podcast kind of took priority and, yeah. and marketing took. And so I'm learning how to do all those things, marketing mm-hmm. and, and just walking through doors. So, right. so yeah, it's, it's a balancing game for sure. And, um, it's, it's hard to do. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Well, if there's a mom listening, I'm just going to speak to you moms listening right now. If you're listening and you have a hard relationship with your dad or you're no longer with the father of your children and that's a hard relationship between them, I'm going to encourage you to get this book and use this as a starting point to begin to um, to shift that to at least viewing that relationship through a healthier lens and helping um, make dad a positive person in your life. Um, so there's my plug, get this book. It's really good. (laughs) Um, and Amanda, as we, as we wrap up here, one thing I ask every guest, it's a little more lighthearted and it's a fun way to end, but, um, what's your favorite, uh, time-saving gadget or tool? Well, I am in love with the Revlon hairdryer curler combo. So I got it from my daughter. The one that's the brush. Yes, it's a brush, but it's super high powered. Mm -hmm. You know, it was at Costco, Mm -hmm. and I got it from my daughter for Christmas. And my daughter has only used it once because it's in my drawer, and I use it all the time. It it cuts my hair time down from whatever it was before, probably fifteen twenty minutes to under ten. Yes, I have the same one. Oh, do you? (laughs) Yes, you. You know what? It has like a pink pinkness too. I don't know what the name of it is, but, um, I love it. And it's just so easy on, you know, you use dry shampoo, let's say that's yeah. the other time saving thing I love. And then you, I, I put that thing on, do a few swipes and voila, we're done. It's wonderful. <laughs> I know I was yeah. in air dry only before. And then I got that. And I'm like, Oh, I can style my hair. <laughs> I have time. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's oh, my favorite. So, so how can people connect with you? Well, they can go to my website, themadeforbooks.com. Um, that's where you can buy every book that comes from that my site gets an autograph. And there's a little dog in the book that is present on almost all the pages. So um, her name is Holiday and she potographs the book as well. And I can put a special note in each book. So that that's on my website. But the book is available anywhere books are sold, Amazon, anywhere else. And on socials, Instagram and Facebook, you can find me at the Made for Books or Amanda B. Glass. Excellent. And you do, uh, you have a couple of offers for our listeners today, and I will put links to those down in the show notes. Um, but the first you said is uh, a coupon code. Um, and then the other thing that you're offering is a uh, free conversation starter guide for parents to use with their kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they can just go to the made and enter their email. And then that's, that's what right. they'll get sent. Correct. That's right. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yes. Great. 
Well, Amanda, I have really enjoyed our conversation today and um, hearing about your dad and how this book came around. And uh, um, as we all think about our dads, and this is a great gift for Father's Day for any day. So I encourage people to go and check it out. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.